Hi. <coughs> so today's talk, we're going to talk about containers and all the different ways that containers are starting to be used or, or in, in the operating system. Uh, so believe it or not, this is actual product in, uh, I think it's in China or something. So they have actually Unixware containers. So pretty good picture. Okay, so when we talk about containers, most people are talking about uh, application uh, sandboxing. Uh, matter of fact, if you went to Leonard's talk a little early, he talked about application sandboxing. Uh, and there's a couple of big trends going on uh, in the environment. There's a whole trend to multi-tenancy, which is basically having multiple people on your computer that you don't necessarily trust, or multiple virtual machines, multiple um, systems on it or just running multiple Apache servers, things like that. So uh, what we're trying to do here is application containment, either at the desktop level, at the server level, at, um, um, you know, at higher levels. And over the years, there's been several, um, several s products that have tried to do this. I mean, the Java v VM is probably one of the original ones. And the idea there was to contain stuff that was going on in your web browser on your desktop, make sure it can't touch your desktop, right? Um, SE Linux is all about controlling what processes do, but it can only control, it can really only control what a process is designed to do. So the, the early, again, back to Leonard's talk, he talked about uh, Firefox. So the holy grail of SE Linux has always been to control Firefox. But the problem with SE Linux is it, it basically wraps Firefox and you say something like, well, Firefox, uh, I, I could design a policy that said Firefox can only read, uh, could only upload from um, the uploads directory and can only download to the downloads directory. So now the user goes and he clicks the file uh, load button and it comes up and he says, I want to upload from uh, you know, some random directory. And all of a sudden, SE Linux comes up and says, no, no, you're not allowed. Firefox tried wanting, wanting. Firefox tried to read this random file. So th because of the way Firefox is designed, it's designed to read anywhere. It's designed to write anywhere. I want to download to any directory I want. So the whole design of applications was wrong for Firefox. So what we want to do is build a mechanism for, for securing these. Another security mechanism of uh, running multiple applications on desktop is full virtualization, KVM, VMware. Um, and, and those things actually do a really good job of, of you know, if I run a VM with Firefox, that Firefox can't touch my desktop. So I, I got some you know, security there if I can run multiple VMs. But VMs have big problems in that they take a long time to start up. They're a huge management headache. So for every VM I create, I have an entire operating system I want to manage. So what we want to do is we want to get the either, well, we want to get something a little easier to set up. Uh, OpenShift is actually another container or another mechanism, right? OpenShift right now has thousands and thousands of Apache web servers running on the internet totally untrusted. We're giving away shell access to every one of those accounts. Anybody in the world can come on there. So any hacker in the world can get onto one of those boxes. And, and we have right now, I, I, I don't know if that's secret or not, but there's, there's a lot of boxes and there's a hell of a lot. And I'm talking hundreds of thousands of people have at least logged on and done something on, in an OpenShift environment. So it's been vastly successful. And, but we're running all these guys in, in sort of containers. but. The real problem there is that the OpenShift environment is very, you know, put together by some experts, as admins. But how do we get the technology down to a, a, a normal admin that could do it or a normal user on the system? So first of all, Linux containers, there's no such thing. Okay, you can all leave now. All right, containers, the kernel doesn't understand containers. In Solaris, there was a thing called Solaris containers. And most of the times when you talk to customers that know anything about containers, they always compare Solaris containers to Linux containers. Uh, and Solaris containers, to me, are more close, closely related to VMs or KVMs. Um, so the kernel doesn't understand anything about con containers, and we've sort of built user space concepts of what a container is. All right, it's just a, it's just a user space idea of what a container is. So other thing that when people talk about containers, everybody thinks of this LXC command set. LXC was built by IBM a few years ago to take advantage of some namespaces, which I'm going to cover in a minute. Uh, but it was very tied to the way the kernel did, um, did namespacing. So people I I have a hard time using LXC. So it was decided by Red Hat um, that we would not support LXC. 
uh, but we would support some other mechanisms for doing it. And guess what? Because we're Red Hat, we have two ways that are coming along to do it. Two competing, and I'm going to cover both of those. And actually, I created a third way. <laughs> Matter of fact, I created the first container way back in RHEL 5, a thing called PM Namespace. I didn't really create it, I just took advantage of the kernel thing. PAM Namespace has been around since RHEL 5, and what PAM Namespace does is basically allows users to log into a system with different home directories and different slash temps depending on their security level. It was really built for MLS systems, um, and the idea was that you could log into a system at top secret, you would have one desktop, you'd log in at secret, you'd have a different desktop. And because you can't have top secret and secret data in the same place, so that we they created this thing called PAM Namespace. So in RHEL 6, I created a thing I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to demonstrate in a minute called the Sandbox, a C Linux Sandbox. Anybody know, ever play with that? Okay. I think it's the coolest thing on the whole desktop, but maybe I'm, you know, a little biased there. Try it out. Okay. What the SE Linux Sandbox, well, I'm going to cover that, in, I think, in the next slide. Um, so anyways, the uh, SE Linux Sandbox allows you to do something. I, I'll cover that later. but. Uh, it isn't a full, sort of the full container in mind. System D, as of Fedora 17, introduced a couple of the uh, namespaces into uh, System D so that services can basically request sort of private, one of them is called private temp. Uh, a huge security hole over the years has been people using untrusted names or, or bad names when they're creating temp directories. I've been on a crusade for years to stop any privileged process from ever using slash temp. Users are in slash temp. If you're a privileged process, you use slash run. But not everybody listens to me. So when they use system, when they use slash temp, if you use an easily guessable name, that can be, uh, uh, users can attack it. Matter of fact, you constantly see CVEs coming up about easily guessable names. So what system D did is they actually basically said that a service could come up and have its own slash temp. The best service for that is Apache. Because Apache runs lots and lots of PHP scripts that are badly written and they end up doing things like create temp directory, create slash temp slash dan, which, you know, and all of a sudden some user on the system can use that as an exploit or any application the user uses can use exploit. So with system D in se Fedora 17, they introduced private temp and private network. I don't know how many people use private network, but private temp is, uh, we actually, I think there's about 15 or 16 services that are actually using it now. Uh, OpenShift uses a namespace, PM namespace also. They provide private temp and private uh, dev shearmem, and they're using SE Linux to basically provide all the other confinement. Uh, cont okay, this is the one thing I always scream at people. Everybody that ever talks to containers in my presence uses the word, it's a security mechanism. Then I tell them, it's not a security mechanism. It's nothing in containers that's about security. And then they say, yeah, you're right, it's not about security mechanism. In 15 minutes, they say, because containers are a security mechanism, okay? What containers do is they, they really offer you nothing different than UID protection. So if you have a privileged escalation, you can break out of a container and take a machine over. If you allow me to run root in a container, I can take over the machine. So it is not full containment like KVM is full containment or full virtualization. So you have to realize that. So when people compete against OpenShift, they say, whoa, you know, AppArmor can do that, or some other tool can do, do it uh, using virtualization. And, it's, and that's not the point. The point is that if there is a privilege escalation on in an OpenShift instance, and the OpenShift instance becomes UID zero, it doesn't matter. He's still an OpenShift instance. SE Linux prevents him from doing anything. So the real reason that containers aren't about security is that we have not containerized the entire operating system. So there's major subsystems of the operating system that nev have never been containerized. The audited subsystem, SE Linux, all of the system, um, all of slash sys, so any of the kernel file systems you're able to communicate with the kernel are not containerized. Um, the ability to create random device drivers, I mean devices, and then communicate with them, that's not containerized. Um, the ability to mount random file systems. If I can mount random file systems, I can take over the machine. So all those things um, mean that containers by themselves are not security. So I've been talking a little bit about namespaces, but I really only talked about one namespace at this point. Let me take a step back and tell you my definition of a namespace. A namespace is basically as a child saying to his parent, 
I have a different world view of you from now on. So a child basically is di divorcing himself from his parent and saying, I'm going to mount something on slash temp, and what I see on slash temp is not going to be what you see on slash temp. I'm going to create a PID1 that's going to be different than your PID1. <coughs> I'm going to create uh, shared memory segments that you can't see. All right, so as you go through the namespaces, there's, there's currently six of them. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six. So there's a PID namespace, there's a network namespace. Network namespace allows you to do entire Ethernet stacks. You can do IP tables rules, you can do all sorts of controls, routing, everything. Uh, uh, PID namespace is basically different PIDs. So again, everybody can have a PID1. All right. The other one, um, the mount namespace is what TAM namespace was doing. UTS, I don't even know why that's important at this point, but allows you to at least name the internal. If, a, if someone runs host name inside of the container, he will see a different host name than outside the container. He also does domain name, and I don't know if NAS would work with it, but um, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, the last one just came about, which is UID namespace. UID namespace scares the hell out of me, because I really don't understand how that's going to work. And there's lots and lots of problems around UID namespace. Yeah, most likely not. Uh, and especially if you get to shared storage, right? So how, do, how does a UID namespace work when you're talking to an NFS share and, and things like that? But uh, UID namespace has been merged into the kernel. But that's it. That's the only thing that are namespaced right now. So I like this picture, too. So. <laughs> uh, so I get someone that sends me these things all the time, but... Okay, so we mentioned, I mentioned quickly Sandbox X. Sandbox X is taking advantage of two namespaces. Uh, it's doing the mount and the IPC namespace. Uh, and the real goal of sa uh, Sandbox X, did I jump? I okay, the real goal of Sandbox X is to basically allow you to take any desktop application and run it on its own desktop. So right now, this entire presentation is being done in a sandbox. So what I, uh, the way we use it, is to show it in action. So here's my home directory, all sorts of crap. Temp directory. And show them in home dwalsh. I'm using open box now, and for some reason it's very slow, but all right. So I'm still in home dewalsh, there's nothing there. I'm in temp, there's nothing there. So I basically just ran an X term inside of it. Also, SE Linux wrapped the entire thing, so rather than my user being on confined T or staff T, this thing's now running in sandbox T. So what it's not able to run su, sudo, it's not able to use the network, it's basically a totally locked down environment. So if I'm showing this open office uh, presentation right now, I can rely on open office not being able to take my .ssh keys and upload them to the internet. It also runs its own X server. So in some ways, this is somewhat similar to the sandboxed applications that are coming in the future, and this is the type of things I would abuse those sandbox applications with when it shows up. What's this good for? Everything I download from the internet in a PDF or a .doc file, Firefox automatically runs events or open office inside of one of these sandboxes so that that application cannot attack my desktop. So it's using it for sandbox confinement. But I got lots of other ones to show you. So just to show you, you can run events inside of it as events. And it basically, you can run entire desktops inside of these things. But that's actually available in RHEL 6. And again, it can take any application. You can run Firefox, run the entire desktop, any X Windows application inside of it. So the next container I'm going to talk about is a thing called systemd nspawn. Now nspawn is basically the ability to create a container, and in really at this point its only real use is being a soup, well, I shouldn't say Leonard's giving me a glaring eye right now. Its only use right now is for fully uh, installed operating systems, okay? But it's really kind of cool, and I'm about to show you something with it that's really neat. Um, it's it requires you to install an operating system in a cheroot, and it's really kind of cheroot on steroids. Okay? It has no SE Linux tied to it yet. Uh, and it's got, but basically it sets up pretty much full containers inside of it, and you can do uh, really neat things in it. Matter of fact, 
This is a, a rawhide system because I like living dangerously. <laughs> and um, oh, don't you love it? Uh, This is a rel system right now, I mean a rawhide system right now booting up a Debian operating system. So I can run an entire Debian, and now if you notice it is blowing up, I've got to talk about Linux to explain why that's happening. But it's kind of cool, I can actually run full Debian software on top of my operating system using systemd and spot. Um, I don't know. I haven't done any uh, performance testing on it. Yeah, the I don't know. I, I just set it up an hour ago and it partially works right now. But anyway, so the idea here is that I can instantaneously run any operating system in it. But one of the problems with the what he's got right now is that I again have to manage lots and lots of operating systems. So if I want to run a hundred Apache servers all in one of these containers, I have to build a hundred operating systems. So Apache gets a vulnerability, I have to do a hundred installs of Apache. It's the same problem that we have with VMs. The nice thing about it is it starts instantaneously. And the other thing I can do is I can run applications inside of that thing and not even have to bring up the entire operating system. So I could do something like testing out a Debian application in there. Putting my RHEL hat on, guess what? When RHEL 7 comes out, this is going to be there. So I can install an entire RHEL 6 operating system underneath it, use this tool to run individual applications inside of a RHEL 6 operating system on top of a RHEL 7. Might work, might not, not sure, but theoretically that should work. Um, so you get some pretty good functionality and actually met with uh, the rest of the stuff I'm about to show you. Yep? Uh, is there still the problem that if you get a leak inside it, uh, then you are essentially exposed? Yes. I, I have not talked about any security in any of this. So the only way to secure containers is SE Linux. Like it or hate it, that's the way it's got to be. Okay? And we're about to show you what we've done, done for libvirt, which has a different competing one. And what I'm about to say is that we've m I've met with Leonard, this pa Leonard and Kay this past, hi, um, <laughs> this past week, and we talked about some features that they could add to this to make uh, some of the stuff I'm about to show you work better. So another good use case, I believe, for this would be replacing mock with it. So mock could get more locked down. All right, so the, the competing technology to system D end spawn was developed by Dan Berenger in the Libvirt project. And it has some really nice features in it, and it has some uh, other features. And, and it would be really good if we can get these two things to work together, or at least to be supported. But Libvirt LXC <coughs> is, you know, the, the idea here is that Libvirt, L Libvirt already has all the knowledge about how to handle virtual machines how to set up networking, how to do all sorts of functionality with the virtual machine, uh, and it even knows about SE Linux. So SVIRT, you know, it launches all virtual machines with SE Linux labels, so uh, there's lots of knowledge inside of LibVirt to launch these containers, and then we could wrap them with SE Linux, with C groups, uh, some other stuff. And, and so it, it's a different, slightly different model, or a very different model than just executing systemd end spawn, um, but we've been working on it to basically build these secure containers. Um, the other thing is Libvirt LXC is actually available right now in RHEL 6. Okay, what you can do is you can launch a container that gives with bash a fin shell in a container as 6.4 um, with this, and then you're on your own. So I'll give you, they can give you a bin shell. You could put, do a similar thing what we did with uh, NSpawn. I guess you could put an entire operating system in there and boot it, but it's really up to you as a really clever administrator to build containers in 6.4. So one of the things we look at when we're looking at building some additional security into containers is looking at use cases. Because I can't really handle this sort of the general purpose operating system running inside of a container and actually wrap it with SE Linux and make it secure. If I want to do that, that's called KVM virtualization. I can't do a general purpose operating system. What I can do is applications. So the application we've looked at the strongest is doing Apache. That's the OpenShift model, so why can't we do that with containers? 
So what we want to do here is we want to run multiple virtual, uh, multiple Apache servers, have strong isolation between them, allow you to run root and do administrative tasks inside of your container, um, and and just run. So every one of them will be a virtual instance. When I looked at doing this, I decided to build a little sh Python script because I like to do Python, and I built a thing called Vert Sandbox Service, and what that does is actually creates content that libvirt will then use to launch virtual launch containers, secure containers in their environment. We took huge advantage again of system D in these things because we want to run a very small operating system inside of each one of the containers. We want to run system D, we want to run system D uh, journal D, DHCP to get an I IP address and then Apache. That's the only thing we run inside of the containers and um, system D does a real nice job of, of handling that type of environment. Uh, when we create these things, we're actually trying to create systems that are going to share the slash user partition. I don't want to have a hundred slash users, so I have to do a hundred Apache updates. Um, the rest of the data, so the writable data for the container is going to be stored in a Cheroot type environment. It's not a full Cheroot environment but it basically is a, an environment underneath there, and we bind mount on top of a container. All right, and I'll show you it in a minute. Um, the other thing is it, it, they all get launched with SE Linux labels, unique SE Linux labels, and the content is unique. So even though you're in a container and you're running its root, you will not be allowed to, you, you will not be allowed to turn SE Linux off, for example. You will not be able to allow to manipulate C groups. You will not be allowed to make nodes, mount, file system. If you need file system mounted, you have to do it outside. So the administrator the in there would just be able to manage, say, the Apache server. <coughs> so the command that we use for this is vert sandbox service. It'll go out and create these containers on the fly incredibly quickly, and you'll use commands like start an Apache server, stop it. It actually has the ability to execute content inside of a container, which is really kind of cool in that you can do things like run, bin shell, and now all of a sudden you are in the container. So you can be, as the host, enter the container. You can also run if config e0 to get the IP address that's in the container. Uh, and then you can do things, one of the other problems with running lots and lots of VMs is you have hundreds of cron jobs or hundreds of, you know, lots and lots of stuff happening in every operating system. I remember when VMs were first becoming popular, they had trouble with cron jobs all running at the same time, so you'd have 100 cron jobs doing mlocate, so the entire machine at 2 o'clock in the morning would just wake up and run 100 VMs all running you know, mlocate at the same time. So you don't want to run any cron jobs inside of your containers. You want to run it outside of the container and then just allow the outside of the container to enter the container and do something like log rotate. So with our containers effort, we actually have uh, a log rotate script that enters the container and executes log rotate. And you could do other stuff like that. Again, we tied, not only do we have these command lines, but we're actually creating systemd unit files. We want to treat all containers, all containerized applications as if they're a regular system service. So the administrator is going to use all standard systemd controls to manage and manipulate his containers. All right, we don't want to have, you know, oh, you've got to fire a BERT manager to manage your containers. Everything should be done through systemd. Let it one. But basically, so, so if you're running an Apache web server and it happens to be in a container, why would you run that in a different subsystem than if you're running an Apache server in your machine? Not only that, but we also create a target for all of our containers. So if you want to start up 100 Apache web servers, that, you know, have 100 Apache containers running on the system, you go into the Apache httpd.target file and just start it up. Um, and then you can just start your sandbox. So you can use system control to actually start sandboxes, stop sandboxes, um, stuff like that. So let's go in. Enough talking. I want to show you something. Okay, so here I have a for loop. Um, oh, and it's good. I have a bug in it. Yet I wanted to make this as simple as possible for system administrators to set these things up. So what we're doing here is it actually is going to run the vert sandbox. Why don't I show you just actually an individual command first?
All right, someone yell out a name. How creative. I do that all the time. Please ignore my typos. Okay, I just created a container. That easy. It's full operating system created a container. What the tool did under the cover is it looked for HTTPD.unit uh, file, so prevent, it provided a unit file, then went and did an RPM dump of the unit file to see what content that unit file has associated with it. If it found something under var or slash Etsy, it actually created a directory underneath. Um, So it saw that there was well, it saw that there was content underneath Apache. So it created all this content under it. Actually, since I used the dash c command, it actually cloned all the Apache content off the host into that subdirectory. Not only that, but it created a brand new slash var. So what we're going to do in this container is we're going to actually mount slash var over the real slash var in the system, and that <coughs> these products are going to have their own private slash var. I have to do some hacking here because we as operating system developers do a really crappy job of operating system development. We don't tell packages to package and user. We say you can package wherever the hell you want. Okay? And that's a problem. Right? Slash var live RPM. Why is that there? You know, that should be in user live RPM. It's a list of what the RPMs installed. All right. If it has to write to you, if it has to write to user for its content, it should be in there. But it's in here, so all of a sudden you're going to lose RPM. So I have to do all sorts of hacking inside of this thing to get it right because users, because uh, the operating system is writing to slash var. But anyways, we mount slash var. I also do some mounting of slash home. I also mount, mount slash home and slash root. I really don't have to do that because SC Linux will prevent the container from touching those. But when uh, I watch OpenShift logs every day, and the first thing anybody that gets onto OpenShift does is they start probing. Everybody likes to probe. I want to run fine slash and see what I can see. Okay? And as soon as that happens, SC Linux ABC start jumping through the roof, and I slowly but surely start to say, I don't care if you're running your fine command. Get, you know, stop, you know, stop in the logs and ignore those logs. But basically, because of that, I wanted to hide slash home and slash var, uh, slash root from the, the container, and they get their own var, and they get us partially um, hidden Etsy. So anyways, let's, a let's actually run the container. Actually, let's do it this way. I didn't call it that, I called it DIN. <coughs> so it's up and running. If I do an if config now, you'll see my stack, so. I got BR1 and EM1 and L0, what if I do So I'm rooting inside of the container. <coughs> Permission of that read only. So one of the things we do in these containers, we actually mount remount slash as read only. Uh, but it's also blocking SE Linux stuff from happening. So if I go look at slash var now, <coughs> I see contain stuff there, but if I go outside. see a lot more stuff in that bar. So if I went up to here and I said, touch die, I don't know why I can't spell my own name, but 
There's no dar inside there. But if I go here, Oops. There's the file. Okay, so basically there's all sorts of bind mounts going on here. If I do a PS minus EZ, it shows me what's going on here. All the processes inside of the container are running as this SVIRT LXC uh, net T locked down. You see the system D is running inside of there. You see system D journal D. You see DH client. You don't see Apache. For some reason, Apache won't start when I'm on a wireless network because it says it can't recognize its IP address. When it runs on a hardware ne hard network, it works. I don't know why. So I can do things like if config. And I see now I got E0 inside of the container. Okay, I have an IP address inside the container. So I have a different loop, local host, everything inside of the container. If I try to do something evil like Look at, uh, let me check is SC Linux enforcing or not. Anybody believe I would run a machine with SC Linux <laughs> disabled? <laughs> uh, what's going on here is SC Linux is lying. Okay, it's faking it out. No, no, we're disabled, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but the real reason we're doing that, the reason SC Linux is disabled inside the container is we won't, do not want the containers to try to do SC Linux stuff. Okay, because lots and lots of applications, they see SC Linux is enabled, they'll do things like load policy or, or, or whatever. So we just want to, inside of the container, you're in your own little world. Okay, it's like Las Vegas. What goes on in Vegas stays in Vegas. Okay, <laughs> so we don't really care. So inside of the container, we're saying go to town. Right? You know, we're not going to worry about it. What we worry about is that container affecting the next container over. All right? And that's what we're trying to wrap up. Inside of the container, you're not able to mount. We've eliminated mount. We've eliminated make node. We create the device drive devices for you, and you can run an Apache. Inside of these containers, I have run Apache, MySQL, PostgreSQL. Um, I've run an SSH, SSHD inside of it, although that's not my preferred way of doing it. I'd like to run the SSHD on the host and then enter it. That's the way OpenShift does it, um, and other commands. So I can do other neat things with containers, like from the outside. Yeah, why didn't that work? Okay, so I can basically. Is if config an SVIN? It is. That's a bug. Did not print out an error message when it failed to run bin config. So I can sit outside the container and run commands inside the container. So I talked about log rate rotate. If I want to look at the journal inside of the container, I can actually run the journal command inside the outside the container. Okay, I've actually tried to hack. You guys have some hack that I can put a link in. Nah, that really doesn't feel good, but this seems like it's pretty easy to do. I think this is far easier to do than, than what you guys have tried to do. But anyway, so I can do things like looking at the log files inside of the container. So you get the, the idea that actually containers are pretty easy to do. So let's set up 100 of these things. Well, I'll set up 50. Did I lose my do loop? While our journal is running inside the container. Yes. I don't know where it's stored. That's magic. I mean, that's just something you understand. So right now I'm creating 50 containers. Try to do that with the VMs. All right, we're just going to go off and create them. Instantaneously, I have 50 
containerized op uh, Apache servers running on my environment. And what's it taking? About 30, 40 seconds? I tried to get, to get this doing parallel, but it's doing a lot of copies. I'm cloning off that Apache data all the time. That's why it's actually as slow as it is. So now I'm going to go and do a system control, start HTTPD dot sandbox target. At this point, LiveBird is going out of its frigging mind because <sighs> it's getting hundreds of connections telling it to start up all these containers. Uh, Ten minutes. I need more time. Um, it's starting up hundreds and hundreds of containers. I see things like swapping starts to happen on my machine. I need a beefier laptop to run. Uh, actually, I usually run 100, but the entire machine nearly melts until it gets stabilized and then everything works fine. But while it's starting up, so I think there's some problems with LibVirt doing this. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Well, I usually just do a PS of system D, but if you want to see everything. What is a PS tree? Well, that's the other one. So here they are all coming up. Okay, so it's, it basically starts to run them, but usually what I do is I just do a PS EZ rep for uh, system D. And so you start to see. Let's see if I got them all up yet. Hmm? You're using up my last 10 minutes. EF what? And Z. Oh, I don't need the Z, actually. Yeah, so you see him right here. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the Berkeley syntax. I always use Z. Uh, anyways, so you get to see the containers. Now if I went and did that... So it's showing all the containers what the IP addresses are of them. So each one of them has gone out and got their own IP addresses, their full environments. I can enter any one of them, but i got about seven minutes left before he puts up a, another sign at me here. So there's other use cases you could use for this containers. I already mentioned mock is a possibility. Uh, we can run customer services on Gluster Node. Gluster Nodes is a use case that's looking into containers, and that's the one that always says it's about security. Not about security. It's about security. So they don't want to run SC Linux on it. So they want it about security, but not about security. If I pick one, uh, MySQL inside a container. OpenShift workload is the next thing we really want to tackle. But I got to get the OpenShift guys to focus on something. They're so busy working on getting out the product that they can't work on the new stuff. But we want to tie some of this stuff into OpenShift. So future of containment of these applications. The new tool call out called Live Subcomp. It's starting, I think System D started to appropriate it. It's coming into other applications. What SecComp does is allows you to get rid of syscalls. So the way, uh, one of the big problems with containers or with um, SE Linux or anything else is we're really relying on the kernel to be correct. So the more syscalls you can make into the kernel, the more likely you are able to attack the kernel. But like SecComp allows you to drop syscalls. Uh, a syscall I would like to see adopted is basically drop 32-bit syscalls off, uh, uh, off of 64 bit machines. If I'm not going to run a 32-bit machine uh, oper uh, process on my machine, I don't want 300 syscalls that are all vulnerable to being attacked by a, a hacker. So LiveSecComp is a really cool tool that's just showing up now. Systemd end spawn with Vert Sandbox. See, I showed these guys what we can do with it, and all of a sudden they're going to go and make it works, so it's, uh, it'll work with that. Uh, we need a mechanism to track containers. This is a big problem with systemd end spawn, is I can't go out and say list all the containers on the system. Steve Grubb's ready to have a bird over this because people that care about this want to know what containers do I have running on my system? How do I discover what containers are on it? We need to name these things. 
Okay? We need to tell this. You, you have to get better tools eventually, like PS Free, to show me what's going on in the individual's containers, what containers are running on the system, how do I list them. These containers are going to start to show up all over the place. There's uh, problems with the audit subsystem with actually system D and spawn right now because we made, I got five minutes left, I got to go quick. Uh, because uh, the audit subsystem basically sets a rule, uh, we want to set a rule that says when you log on to a system, you can never change your session ID or your login UID. Except if you start up a container, because that has a totally different PID namespace. So all, all that stuff goes out the window when you start up containers. So we need to re uh, recognize that. Audit has to, the kernel has to send audit messages that reflect that this message came from a container. We want to allow containers to send audit messages. But if a container is able to send an audit message that fools the host into doing some activity because it, uh, you, you, it doesn't realize that the audit message came from the container, so we have to have uh, that added. Uh, must be named, must be discoverable. Kernel, uh, blah, blah, blah. We need to work on UnionFS. Any file system people in here, we need UnionFS to work. I'm doing some hacks on bind mounts to cover up the fact that UnionFS does not work. It would be really nice if I could just go in and rewrite Etsy hostname inside of one of the containers. Instead, I have to create a subdirect, a, a file, bind mounted over the Etsy hostname in order to get that to work correctly. So I could say hostname inside of a container. Um, other parts of the, and again, that's partly because we suck as operating system developers, but, you know. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so there's things like that, because we really want to sort of share most of Etsy, you know, at least like we want to share the languages. We don't want the people having to set up the languages in each one of the containers, things like that. Um, so we want to contain the uh, thing. Anyways, what's going to break? No one's done this before. Right now, I have hundreds of processes running on it. Things like the total and the maximum number of open file descriptors controlled by root. Is that going to break? Total amount of binds happening on a system. Total amount of, of whatever, right? This is just exploding stuff technology into the world that we have no idea what's going to break. I don't even know if the SE Linux confinement actually is fully confining a root process. And I'm sure the hackers will eventually tell me 15 ways that they can break out, and then we're going to have to react to all of those. I've already hopped on getting the hell out of uh, Etsy and VAR for, I, I, my dream of world is that I can do an RM slash RF of slash VAR and slash Etsy, reboot the machine and it works fine. Totally clean. <laughs> yeah, I do, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's it. Any questions? I, I, I was so clear. Oh, there is a question. Oh, shoot. Because you only have caches now inside your, your namespace, right? So, I mean, are you... Well, what I'm, fear I'm fearful of there is that they could mount file system, other file devices and things like that. I mean, it's just basically trying to control what they... And they could, uh, they could bind mount over random locations, things like that. Well, I mean, even just to have the hostname right or whatever out of the... Well, that's what we have done. No. Do you think it could be useful then? Uh, I, I, yeah, the question is, could we eventually build containers to be as good as virtualization? Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, as far as security point of view. Uh, my opinion, if you want to run a container and have it do mounts and make nodes and run root and dot knob wrap it in SE Linux, I have no problem with that as long as you don't mention the word security when you're talking about it. So running Debian up there is fine. I don't care about that. But it's basically, I if you start saying security, then I got a problem because you're really kind of lying to the customer or to the user base. You know, it's sort of like, oh, there's security, and then you say, nah, well, are you going to run privileged processes? Is it, you know, what's the number one thing people worry? When you get exploits, there's always been this decision on exploits between whether it's a local exploit or a remote exploit. Now, a lot of these things, OpenShift, everything, every rem local exploit is now a remote exploit because we're allowing it to SSH into the box and do anything you want. You got a user account on. So it's all a matter of security. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, 
Right. RPM-QF of the unit file. I'm not that smart. Uh, you also, you can do multiple dash U, so you can do my SQL. I'm out of time. Okay, so you can do multiple unit I'm going to keep going and just uh, wait till he <laughs> tackles me. You can do multiple unit so, so you can do your dash U, my SQL. It's a, look at the shell script. It's rather simple what's going on there. All right? Thanks for coming. Colin, I'm not.